Hi everyone, and welcome back to the Retro Shack. And we've got a bit of work to do today, as we're going to be starting the upgrades to this Sinclair QL to hopefully get it to a point where we can see if it's a usable and viable option to run all of the core elements it takes to run this YouTube channel. Well, the non-video bits when the camera is not running, but that still need to be done. So that's script writing with Quill, finances with Abacus, and archive for storing inventory. Right. Lots to do, so let's crack on. Here at the Shack, we'd like to give a huge thank you to the sponsor for this video, PCB Way. They help us out with all of our PCB fabrication needs and make fantastic boards at amazingly competitive prices. And it's not only PCBs that are on the menu. Apart from other fabrication services like CNC machining, 3D printing, sheet metal fabrication and injection moulding, PCB Way also have a great projects library of cool stuff to build from people all around the world. Oh, and if you don't like waving a soldering iron about, they can even assemble your PCBs for you. That's the PCB way. Right, on with the show. Right, first things first, this QL doesn't work, doesn't even boot up, but I reckon I know why, because I've looked inside and there's a bit missing. And I also noted that the keyboard won't work because the membrane is all cracked and broken. So we'll need to replace that with a nice shiny new one. And that bit that is missing is quite an important bit, being the ROM. So we'll be popping in this replacement Minerva ROM, which is a re-implementation of the QL's QDOS, which fixes loads of bugs and adds in tons of new features, such as faster floating point arithmetic, generally faster super basic, including trace functions and better details debugging, support for dual screens, and loads of other cool things. The machine didn't come with a power supply, so I've got this nice new one from Keylog that outputs the correct and odd 9V DC and 15.6V AC that the QL needs. I also got hold of this RGB to SCART lead so we can hopefully get a nice clear picture out of the old girl, especially if we're running all those lovely business apps. And the main event will be building and installing this OctaDrive, which is a modern microdrive replacement that uses an Arduino Nano to emulate the microdrive and either a Raspberry Pi or your desktop machine to provide a modern web interface and control software for managing the software cartridges themselves. This is the Raspberry Pi version, which can be installed inside the QL. And this is the smaller unit if you just want a simple way of adding more modern storage. We'll go through the pros and cons of both. Many thanks to PCB Way for supplying the PCBs as always. And if you're interested in building one of these OctaDrives for yourself, there's a link to the PCB Way shared projects page in the video description. I also got hold of these old microdrive cartridges and have no idea yet if they even work or have anything on them. Last but by no means least, this machine had several of the original screws missing, so we've got a full pack of new screws for when we're all finished and done. So we've got all this stuff to do, where shall we start? Well, I guess the first thing to do would be to see if the missing ROM chips, which as you may have guessed should be sitting here in these empty sockets, are the only thing stopping the machine from actually booting up. So let's pop our new Minerva ROM in and see what happens. If there are any issues, there's a Diagnostic Toolkit ROM on here also, and we can select that ROM by moving the red jumper to its alternate position. But let's just see if it works first. There are two sockets here, and it shouldn't really matter which one we plug into, but we'll pop the ROM into the leftmost socket, like so, making sure it's firmly in place. Let's plug in the power supply, and we need to be careful here because it's a tight fit and the power connection on the QL isn't very secure, but with a gentle wiggle, we're all good to go. Quickly pop in the SCART lead. This one is from the Retro Computer Shack. No affiliation to the Retro Shack, but I do get a lot of my leads from there as they're always great quality. Okay, let's plug the old girl in and see if all she needed was that ROM. And, well, that's a good sign. We've got the Minerva logo and all 128K showing as available. And 
Even though we haven't got a keyboard attached, this ROM has a boot timeout so that even if we don't press a key, after 15 seconds or so, the machine will continue to boot to the default TV mode. A flashing cursor, which is happy days for us. The next thing on our list is to replace the keyboard membrane because, well, this one is in a bit of a state and it looks like someone has already cut it back once, but really once they get this brittle, a replacement is the only way to go. These are available on Sell My Retro for around the £25 mark if memory serves, and it's simply a matter of undoing all the screws on the back of the metal keyboard plate, removing the old membrane, putting the new one in, and then putting all the screws back in. 10 minutes tops. We'll just plug the new keyboard membrane into the mainboard, being careful not to crease the new ribbon cables, and once we're happy they're in place, we can turn the machine on again and see if the keyboard is working. Well, let's take that as a yes. So now we have a fully working Sinclair QL with an updated ROM, new keyboard membrane, new power supply, and a new video cable. So let's move on to the micro drives. In the QL, some software is coded to only allow booting from micro drive one, which is the leftmost drive in here. So that's the one we'll replace with the internal Octa drive unit so that we have the most flexibility and convenience. The Octa drive can actually emulate eight micro drives at once, hence the Octa part of the name. We'll leave the second micro drive in there so we still have the option of using actual micro drive cartridges should we want to. For now, we'll remove this heat sink for the voltage regulator so we've got better access to the micro drive we want to remove, which is this one here, referred to as MDV1 underscore by the operating system. And this is held in by two screws here and here, so let's whip those out. Once those screws are out, we can remove the ribbon cables from the socket on the mainboard and put the whole unit aside. So its replacement is going to be this internal Octa drive on this PCB designed by Dalby and it's a neat all-in-one solution. It's taken me a while to collate all the bits and I dry populate a board while I'm doing that so I know what I still need to get. And I needed an Arduino Nano like this one but not this one and a Raspberry Pi, not this one, but a 0W because we need Wi-Fi. There's also this voltage regulator. There's this voltage shifter to drop the 9 volts supplied down to a safe value for the Pi and Nano. There's some headers and other bits to collate, but essentially it's a really simple bill of materials and about 15 minutes to put together to get you this, a completed Octa Drive unit. And don't it look pretty? Using many of the same components, I've also put together this external Octa drive. It's a much simpler layout with no Raspberry Pi to worry about, and we also don't need the voltage regulator or the level shifter, as this Nano will be powered entirely from our PC's USB port. PCBWay also printed this little case for it, which makes the whole thing just look super cute. Anyway, more on that later. For now, let's prepare this internal Octa drive for use. Fitting the unit itself requires these little spacers to be fitted so that the unit doesn't drop down too far and short against other components on the mainboard. We need to connect the Octa drive to the QL's micro drive connector like this. And I've used patch wires here because this connector is a push fit and this just makes it easier. Once the drive is in place, we then need to sort out the software side of things. We essentially have to set up the Raspberry Pi with the OctaDrive software and we also have to program the Arduino Nano so it can play its part as the microdrive itself. Now there are lengthy instructions to get an OctaDrive setup working and this is only one of those setups. Check out the OctaDrive landing page for all of the other options but luckily for us this combined all-in-one PCB also has a nice simple all-in-one setup package to make things very simple indeed. There's a link in the description for the image and effectively all we need to do is to download and copy it to a nice fast SD card and then make a simple change to the WPA supplicant comp file to tell the Pi which Wi-Fi to connect to. Once that's done, we'll pop the SD card into the Raspberry Pi, the Pi will boot 
download the OctoDrive software and install it. It will then fire a bunch of scripts to download the firmware for the Nano and then program that directly over GPIO from the Pi itself. And then, all being well, we'll be able to access the OctoDrive's webpage running on the Pi. Now, all of that sounds primed with opportunity to fail, and if so, there are lots of troubleshooting guides available on the website. And indeed, I couldn't get this to work at all initially, until I thought that perhaps it was just the cheap knockoff Arduino Nano that I was using. And as soon as I put in an official Nano, it worked straight away. And that's the lesson there. Don't skimp on the important stuff. Once you've got the OctoDrive web page up and running in front of you, you can load cartridges into any of the virtual micro drives. You can create blank cartridges, and there's even access to the ZXDB database to download files on the fly, which is much more useful if you're using an OctoDrive on a Spectrum, as the ZXDB doesn't seem to have any QL software on it at all. However, I've gotten hold of the micro drive images for Quill. Abacus, Archive and Easel and using this interface we can assign the Quill image to Microdrive 1 and create a blank cartridge on Microdrive 2. And then on the QL itself doing a directory of MDV3 should show us not found because there's nothing in there. Excellent and doing a directory of MDV1 should show us the files on the Quill cartridge which it does. Also excellent and MDV2 should be blank. Also, as the Pi and Arduino remain powered up when you hit the QL reset switch, the QL should restart and then attempt to boot from whatever cartridge is in MDV1, in our case, Quill. It's important to note that the OctaDrive fully emulates a microdrive, and that includes the speed, which isn't quick. And yes, that seems to work also. So thanks to Alexander Volschwitz, the creator of the OctaDrive, Tom Dulby for the all-in-one PCB design and PCBWay for the PCBs, along with Lawrence Reeves and the rest of the contributors to the Minerva ROM project, we have a working Sinclair QL. Over the next few weeks, I'll be getting to grips with Minerva and the Scion software suite, and I'll be attempting to use this machine on a day-to-day -day basis to get things done around here. And I'll also be keeping an eye out for a memory upgrade of some kind. In the next episode, we'll go through the software side of things and answer the question, can you run a business on a Sinclair QL in 2023? I may even find time to give the plastics on this case a good wash. It certainly needs it. Oh, and finally, that external lock to drive may look cute, but I can't get it to work, and I suspect it's because of another cheap knockoff Arduino Nano, so I'll get another official one, and if that solves the problem, I'm thinking of trying it out on my Spectrum and Interface 1, Microdrive Utopia. As always, thanks for watching, and until next time in the shack, it's goodbye from me. Bye.